This is a new presentation that I put together for you. I wanted to give, um, I, I learned a, um, a little bit about your organization from Mark and also from the website and, and your mission statement and I wanted to give you some information to feed your brains and tell you about how uh, the work that we do in the Minnesota Judicial Branch and the work that I do every day is people work. I work with people. It's a um, very challenging job that we have. Um, it's essential to our um, government. It's essential to our system of justice. And um, hopefully at the end of today's presentation, you'll have a good idea of all of the challenges, all of the rewards, and how um, we fulfill what's promised in our Minnesota Constitution, and that is every person is entitled to obtain justice freely and without purchase, completely and without denial, promptly and without delay. How many of you have served as jurors before? Oh, quite a few of you. I hope that you found your service to be positive. That is one of my favorite things about being a judge, is meeting just everyday people who have no connection whatsoever to the judicial system. They're not lawyers. They've never been in court before. And you really do, I think, get a flavor of what it takes to, or, or how our system works. I'm just um, amazed and in awe that our judicial system works, our justice system works every single time. And it doesn't matter who's on the jury. It is so diverse. I'm sure that those of you who have served as jurors, these are people you never would have met before in your life, but for your jury service. And what's amazing to me is that um, jurors sit together. They listen to all of the same evidence. It doesn't matter what your background is. You can be an Olympic boxer from Lebanon, or the fire chief, or a grandmother of 23, or a someone who works in data processing, or a stay-at-home mom, or a college student, and everybody gets together, listens to the same evidence, goes into a room, talks about it, thinks about the law that's instructed, and you come up with an answer. You solve this problem that has been presented to you. And it has happened for me every single time. Um, I'm just amazed by it. And that's why I take the time, as Mark said, to chat with jurors afterwards, because I want that experience to be positive. I want you to tell your friends and your family and your community that you had a positive experience and to promote trust and confidence in our system. So with that, we're going to talk about what we do in the branch. And let's see. <clears throat> So I find that most people are generally unfamiliar with the nuances of the judicial system. Our Minnesota handles about 1.3 million cases every year, a little under that. I think we're like 1.295 or something like that. And we exist to protect rights, to preserve freedoms, and to essentially be problem solvers. We're solving all kinds of problems, problems involving criminal justice, problems involving families, problems involving children, problems involving businesses and contract disputes, probate matters, civil commitment matters, all kinds of cases. And um, we do that freely. We try our best to ensure access to justice at every turn. And I'll tell you a little bit about some of the initiatives that we have implemented even in the last year to uh, make it more, make our system of justice and make accessing courts more accessible to everyone in the community. Uh, as you know, the judicial system is one of three coordinate branches of government, co-equal branches of government, not the third branch of government, but a co-equal branch of government with the executive, which is generally the governor, <laughs> and then the legislative branch. And if there's any doubt about being a co-equal branch of government, you probably will hearken back to disputes that the governor's office and the legislature have had with each other, and those are resolved by the judicial system, usually starting in Ramsey County District Court as the seat of government and then progressing through the appellate system uh, for a final um, answer. Okay, so it's probably helpful for you to know how I got here and why I'm part of this system uh, that decides these important cases. So I was born in Portland, Oregon. I'm not from here. And I know that makes some people bristle because we all like 
are born and bred uh, home-based Minnesotans. But I'm from Portland, Oregon, but I came here when I was 18 and went to McAllister College. Anybody a Mac grad? Not you. Scott? <laughs> Anybody a Mac grad? I'm the only Mac grad in the room. Oh, dear. Um, I went to McAllister College. I was a political science and economics major at McAllister. Uh, and then I went straight to law school at the University of Minnesota. I, um, I knew I wanted to be here. I came to McAllister for, um, I wanted a small liberal arts college in a big city. But more importantly, I went to Mac for its global, for globalism, its social action, um, it's, it's just promise of, of uh, diverse communities, and I really was so fortunate to go to McAllister um, at such a formative time in my life to absorb that spirit and those values. And I think that it really has carried me through my, um, th carried, carried with me throughout my life. Um, the most important part about my um, tenure at McAllister is I met my husband there. He's from Boston. He's also a lawyer, so he's two years older than me. He graduated from McAllister and went to the University of Law School, so then when I graduated from McAllister, um, I think the list was pretty small of places where I was going to end up going. So we both graduated from the University of Minnesota Law School. I was in private practice for eight years, and I handled civil litigation, which is essentially business disputes, contract disputes, insurance issues, employment issues, any issue that might deal with a business, large or small. Um, and it was a medium-sized law firm, so I got a lot of experience in that role. And then I, um, once I paid off my student loans, which were substantial, I was able to take a public interest job, which was always my goal. And so I went to the University of Minnesota and served as senior associate general counsel uh, for 11 years. And in that role, I handled all of the university's litigation uh, from pillar to post in any campus around the state, any kind of issue. Many of you probably recall a pretty significant trial involving Tubby Smith, our former basketball player. That was me. I was involved in that one. Um, and we've had issues with the light rail transit and um, uh, Dr. Nigerian and um, the AL, uh, the um, the uh, kidney rejection or the organ rejection drug. So I was involved in all of those issues. Um, I loved working at the University of Minnesota. You read a lot of bad stuff in the newspaper about the U. Uh, for me, uh, working with people who are so dedicated, who believe in the mission of a public land grant institution, and really, I feel, strive to do something positive every single day. And really good things are happening at the university every single day. I just loved working there. And I would not have left that job for any other job other than the one that I have now. So I, I was asked earlier today if I um, always knew I wanted to be a judge. And the answer is no. Um, I never really even thought about it, even though I was a litigator. I really started thinking about it about a year um, before I was appointed by Governor Dayton. And this is probably a good time to tell you how judges are chosen. Most of you probably don't even know how judges are selected. So I, um, I think it's a good um, idea to tell you about how that happens. There are 10 judicial districts in Minnesota. So Hennepin County is the fourth judicial district. Ramsey County is the second judicial district. And then there are other districts that are multi-county districts around the state. So Hennepin and Ramsey are the only ones only districts that only have one county. Each county is allocated a specific number of judges, and that's based on population and case filings and need, and we keep very detailed statistics about how those 295 judgeships uh, are um, selected. We have 87 district courts in across 10 districts, 295 judge, uh, judgeships, uh, we hear cases all over the place. In Ramsey County, we hear cases in four locations. So we have the main courthouse on Kellogg Boulevard. We have a law enforcement center, which is where our in-custody criminal arraignments and second appearances occur. Uh, we also hear in-custody matters in our main courthouse. We're equipped to do that. We have a courthouse in Maplewood, which handles our suburban Ramsey County matters, so White Bear Lake, uh, Roseville, uh, Maplewood cases are heard in the suburban courthouse, and we have what's called the 402 building, which is right next to the law enforcement center where we hear our civil commitment matters, which are 
mostly for mentally ill and dangerous individuals in our community, and that's a highly secure facility, as you uh, might imagine. So judge selection of a judge. Upon the death or retirement or a resignation of a judge, the Minnesota Supreme Court will certify a vacancy, and then the governor author authorizes a search for the replacement. That search is conducted by the Commission on Judicial Selection, which is a group of people who are appointed by a combination of the governor and the Minnesota Supreme Court, and it consists of lawyers and non-lawyers around the state. It's led by, there's a chair of the commission right now. Her name is Lola Velasquez Aguilu. She's a lawyer at Medtronic. Before that, it was Lee Sheehy, and he uh, is with the McKnight Foundation. Some of you may know Lee or have heard of him before. Um, the commission then actively solicits candidates for a vacancy and asks candidates fill out about a 20-page application, which pr pretty much includes tell me about everything you've ever done in your entire life from the time you were in kindergarten. And it's very involved. And then they ask for letters of recommendation. They ask for uh, contact information for people that uh, you've had communications with or contact with in your professional capacity. And then they do a thorough vetting process based on uh, criminal background check, professional background check, board of professional responsibility, and vetting all of uh, the information that's supplied. They interview a handful of people, and then they make recommendations for finalists to the governor. And then the governor does the whole thing over again. So I went through that process a few times before um, I was fortunate uh, for... Uh, Governor Dayton to have appointed me, and I'm just very grateful for the opportunity to serve my community in this way. After judges are appointed, they sit for election the first full general uh, in the first general election a full year after they have assumed their position. So I took my seat. I was appointed in November of 2013. I took my seat in uh, January of 2014. The first general election a full year after my appointment was in the fall of 2016. So I didn't have to sit for election essentially nine months or ten months after I, was, uh, I took my job. So I had really the benefit of a couple of years under my belt before I sat for election. Fortunately, I was elected, and so now I only have to sit for re-election every six years. And as Mark said, I'm also the assistant chief judge. That's a... Um, administrative role where I essentially represent all 29 judges in Ramsey County at statewide policymaking um, functions. We have a judicial council that sets policies and procedures statewide, and I represent Ramsey County's interests in that regard. And then we also make assignments of judges, which I'm going to talk about in a few moments, and I assist our chief judge. Our chief judge is um, done in July of this year, and I will be assuming his role in all likelihood at that point in time. So I'll be the chief judge for likely four years. And so I'll have all of those administrative responsibilities with the aid of the chief. So you can see that Minnesota court system has three different tiers. I'm gonna talk a little more about Ramsey County in just a moment, but I wanna go over just some of the other courts in Minnesota. We have a court of appeals, which is a newer court, it's about 30 years old. It's also a creature of statute. Before the court of appeals, and um, maybe Mary Wright, you might remember this. Um, before the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court was hearing a lot of appeals and it was just not sustainable. And so they created a Court of Appeals. It's now expanded to 19 judges. There's one judge for every congressional district. And then there are at-large judges that are statewide appointees for the remainder of the seats. Those cases are heard in three judge panels. For any final order that has come out of the district court, a party may appeal the case to the Court of Appeals for a second look. So when I say a final order, that would be a criminal conviction and sentencing, or it could be a divorce decree, or it could be uh, a civil jury trial and the entry of a verdict. So then those cases can be appealed um, to the Court of Appeals. Those cases are heard in three judge panels, as I said, and they had 2,050 cases filed in 2018. So just a fraction of the cases that we hear or see in district court are ending up at the Court of Appeals. Um, they sit in the Minnesota Judicial Center, which is also where the Minnesota Supreme Court sits. Sometimes they sit in the Capitol Building also. And sometimes they travel to different regions across Minnesota so that 
um, communities who normally would not be able to make it to a hearing in St. Paul, they can see justice at work in panels across the state. And then typically the, any decision that's reached by the Court of Appeals is the final decision in 95% of all appeals that are filed. Um, every Monday at 10 o'clock, the decisions of the Court of Appeals are announced. And usually you'll get about 20 to 30 decisions announced every single Monday. You can sign up on their website and receive a notice and then you can look through the appeals that were decided on any given day. So usually Monday afternoon, if there's been some big decision, you'll see an article in the newspaper about whatever decision has been announced by the Court of Appeals. Okay, so then we have the Minnesota Supreme Court. This is our court of last resort in Minnesota, except when we're dealing with a federal constitutional issue. So like a search and seizure or a due process issue or um, a right against self-incrimination, something like that could be appealed to the United States Supreme Court. But that is really a thin, thin margin of cases. So most of the cases, um, the conclusion of their appellate work will be done at the Minnesota Supreme Court. There are seven justices on the Minnesota Supreme Court. All of them are appointed by the governor. The governor can choose or not choose to use the Judicial Selection Commission to assist in those appointments. And every governor for the, I mean, I think since Governor Carlson has been using the commission for assistance in making those appointments. I know that Governor Dayton and both, and Governor Walls also have been using the commission um, quite heavily because of the rigorous vetting process. Um, in 2018, they released 146 opinions, so they do not speak very often. So they are the only court in Minnesota that gets to choose what cases they want to hear. And usually they only take cases for review on matters of statewide importance or matters of unsettled law or in areas where a change in the law is warranted. Um, they also, re and so most of those opinions come from the Court of Appeals, um, and then the court makes the decision on whether to accept those petitions for further review. They also hear cases from the Minnesota Tax Court and the Minnesota Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals, and they do not have discretion in taking those appeals. So if someone appeals one of those decisions, the Supreme Court has to review that. Um, and then first-degree murder cases, uh, that are tried in the district court, we skip the Court of Appeals in that process and it goes straight to the Minnesota Supreme Court for review and then election disputes. And we just had recently one of those that went straight to the Minnesota Supreme Court for review. The Supreme Court is also um, the regulator of our profession, the regulator of uh, the profession of law and also the regulator of judges. So when judges get into trouble, um, which is not very often because we have a very strict code of conduct and we have a board of judicial standards that oversees and investigates um, uh, conduct of judges that may be in violation of rules. Um, if there's a real big problem, then it goes up to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Recently, in the last five years, there was a judge who was removed uh, from the bench um, judge Alan Pendleton, who was in the 10th Judicial District, a very well-respected judge, but he did not live in the 10th Judicial District. And then when there was an inquiry about his whereabouts, there were some misrepresentations about where he was actually living. So he was living in a different judicial district, which disqualifies him from being a judge in the, in the district where he was sitting. And so that kind of behavior and um, um, it does not do uh, our, our profession um, any, any favors in promoting public trust and confidence. And so I'm actually very grateful that the Supreme Court um, is a, a good regulator of our profession. Uh, we don't want anyone else regulating us. We want them to do the job, really, and they're doing a very good job, in my view. We also have a number of attorneys who are suspended from the practice of law for multiple violations of our um, uh, professional rules of professional responsibility, and they do a good job of um, of that as well, of regulating that as well as well. So now to the good stuff. This is the stuff I really know about what's going on in Ramsey County. So we have 29 judges total, and we have this is how we break down the 29 judges in Ramsey County. We have one chief judge, that's John Guthman. Half of his time is spent handling chief judge issues, and 
For those of you who may have been in a role that's a leadership position, you know that that also comes with it. Um, a, a sign that hangs outside your door that reads complaint department. So everybody wants to complain to the chief or the assistant chief, and so that takes up a lot of time. And then there's a lot of administrative things, like um, um, if we're going to remodel a courtroom or if we're going to realign our calendars or do some other, um, some, some other administrative task. And then he also handles a variety of different calendars. So he might have a criminal calendar one day or a civil calendar one day. He's actually starting the evidentiary hearing next week on the polymet case, on the polymet permits. So because he has more flexibility than some of our other judges that I'll tell you about in a moment, he is able to handle that uh, trial. That's a very interesting case. I've had some discussions with him about some of the interesting issues that are um, that are present in this case. And if any of you want to come down and watch those hearings, they are all open to the public. And it'll be on the 14th floor of the Ramsey County Courthouse if you have any interest in doing it. I think it starts at 9 o'clock on Tuesday. We have two judges. This is a new assignment that we have in Ramsey County. We call it the Master Commitment Judges. They split their time handling our civil commitment proceedings and also master calendars in all of our divisions. And when I say a master calendar, I mean um, a criminal first appearance calendar. So a complaint is filed and um, we're in the jail and an in custody defendant comes out and we present them with the charges, we set bail, we set their next hearing, we appoint a public defender. Those hearings are first appearance juvenile calendars, some of our housing court calendars. Those are our master calendars. The civil commitment proceedings, the reason that we assign two judges specifically to those proceedings is because these are our most vulnerable court customers. They are mentally ill and dangerous or they are experiencing um, a mental health crisis that is um, qu quite serious. And so having some consistency with the judicial officers in those proceedings I think is very helpful for the attorneys that appear um, uh, in those proceedings on a regular basis. It's helpful for the county attorney and it provides some level of expectations for uh, what's going to happen in those proceedings. And so um, we, we chose to make that um, commitment to, to handle those. In Ramsey County, we also hear um, civil commitment proceedings that originate in Washington County as well because they do not have a facility that would accommodate civil commitment proceedings in Washington County. We have three judges assigned to family cases. Those are divorce cases, child uh, uh, custody cases, child support cases. We also have child support magistrates that set those uh, amounts, which are by statute. We have four child protection judges. They handle juvenile delinquency matters and cases involving uh, child protection and placement. Um, they also handle adoption uh, matters. That is my absolute favorite thing to do as a judge, by the way, is handle adoptions. It is the sweetest, most wonderful. Um, it's just wonderful to see so many families opening up their hearts and their homes to these children in need. It is unbelievable. Um, I just love it. It's really fantastic. We have five civil judges. Uh, they handle housing court. We hand uh, judges in civil divisions handle contract disputes. And as I said, we handle um, in Ramsey County cases of statewide importance. There are 54 statutes in Minnesota that provide for original jurisdiction in Ramsey County for um, matters of statewide importance. And I'll give you an example of one of those. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I presided over an injunction proceeding involving um, the extension of time for a comment period on a water runoff um, uh, con uh, construction for the expansion of a chicken um, plant in Wasika. And there were some environmental issues associated with the water runoff uh, that was proposed. And so um, because the Department of Natural Resources uh, was located in St. Paul, uh, and oop, whoops, row, it's coming back. It's coming back. Um, because it is located in St. Paul, uh, those folks were right there, but the folks in Wasika had to come up to St. Paul to handle that case before me. And so um, 
I handled that case, even though it wasn't something, a dispute that originated in Ramsey County. But a lot of those kinds of cases uh, st of statewide importance can and are often filed in Ramsey County, um, mostly because most judges around the state do not have the kind of experience that we in Ramsey County have in handling these kinds of dispute complex issues over and over again. And they don't have judges in, in outstate Minnesota, as I'm, I'll talk about in a minute, that are solely dedicated to handling civil cases. Um, judges mostly in outstate Minnesota handle everything. So in the morning, they might have a criminal arraignment calendar. In the afternoon, they might be handling a divorce. In the following week, they might have a personal injury trial. Um, but in Ramsey County, we do have these sort of dedicated roles. And then we have 14 criminal judges, about half our bench. Uh, half of the criminal judges handle felony cases, um, and that includes one quarter of uh, felony judges' time handling treatment courts. Uh, and I'll talk about treatment courts in a moment. And we have six judges handling misdemeanors, uh, including a quarter-time treatment court judge. And then we have one full-time judge handling treatment courts. Um, and then we have five referees, which are quasi-judicial officers, and they are mostly in our family court division. And they handle cases that are mostly um, long-term uh, family cases that uh, sort of extend a long time uh, beyond the normal uh, time to disposition. And then we have one referee that handles probate matters. Yes? Well, I'm a full-time judge plus all my assistant responsibilities, so I don't get any special administrative time. So my first year as assistant chief, I was in the civil division, and right now I'm doing misdemeanors, and the reason I'm doing misdemeanors is so that I have a good idea of what's happening in the criminal division before I become chief, because we have some, and I'll, I'm going to get to this in a little bit, we have some challenges right now in our criminal division with a number of case filings that we're having um, and staffing all of those cases. It's very challenging right now. Did you have a question? No. Okay. All right. Um, so the other interesting and sort of special snowflake unicorn um, unique thing about Ramsey County is that judges rotate through their assignment. So typically a judge will stay in their division for three years at a time, and then they'll move to a different division. So I'm a civil judge for three years, so I've developed an expertise, a familiarity uh, with civil law of all different kinds, and then I move to the criminal division, and then I develop a familiarity and an expertise in the criminal division, and then I move to the family division and develop an expertise and a familiarity in, in the family division. And I think this is one of the um, a, most luxurious things about Ramsey County, being a judge in Ramsey County, and B, one of the best ways we can serve our public. And that is because we become subject matter experts, which I think is great for members of the public who come to see us. They know they're going to get a judge who knows what they're doing and is familiar with the law, is familiar with their case, isn't distracted with um, some other... Uh, you know, I'm handling a divorce today, but I've got a felony murder trial that's starting next week, which would be obviously something that would be distracting. And so it allows us to focus on one division, um, one subject matter of the law, become an expert. And then the other thing that, the other reason why I say that it is luxurious is because some of these assignments, and I would say felonies and child protection in particular, there's a lot of emotional trauma that is associated with these kinds of cases. Uh, when I handled, I'd handled felonies for two years. And um, it was, and for me, handling cases with young children is probably the most challenging. It's just how I'm built. That's my whole, that's um, my, that, those are my, and uh, that's, that's my trigger. And um, it's very challenging when uh, a seven-year-old has to take the witness stand and recount some terrible things that have happened to them in their life. Um, and then the next week you might have a sex offense case and then somebody is recounting some terrible thing that has happened. Um, and then the next week is uh, some other violent offense, a murder or an assault, and then you see pictures on the screen and 
Um, it's very challenging to have to deal with that year after year after year. And so we really try to give our judges a break if they're in child protection and they're seeing some horrible things with um, some of these young children, we're going to move them to misdemeanors um, after their time in child protection because it's a lot less stressful handling DWIs or trespass cases uh, than it is handling sort of emotional trauma cases with kids. Um, and same with our felony judges. They might move to the civil division so they can deal with money and contracts instead of murders and sex offenses. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any idea what uh, percentage of the judges are former trial court? That's a really good question. So um, I would say most of our judges have had some level of trial experience um, in Ramsey County. I think one of the greatest things about the, the commission and the process of selecting judges is, is that they really try hard to bring a diversity of experience and people to our bench because they really should be reflective of the community. And so I don't think we have any contract lawyers who are judges on our bench, but we do have former St. Paul City attorney. I don't think she was in court arguing cases very often, but she's certainly familiar with the justice system. We have um, former administrators in the public defender's office. At one point in time, many years ago, they were handling cases for the PD's office, but for the last 10 years before they came on board as a judge, they were handling mostly administrative work. So I think there's a variety of experience. I was a courtroom lawyer, so I, I was in court all the time uh, for the university. So it just depends. And I actually think that that's good, that we have such a good diversity of experience. We actually try to match some of the experience um, that people bring to the bench to our division. So at any given time, we have a heavy duty civil practitioner or two in the civil division. We have former prosecutors or public defenders in felonies and misdemeanors so that um, judges can learn from each other as well. And we do have bench meetings and um, internal education programs so that we can learn from each other. So we have a really good collegial bench that um, well, we, we can help each other out, too. Um, okay. That's what we look like. And so the 29 judges have to handle a pie, a big pie of cases that come in. Um, this slide gives you a pretty good um, idea of what our cases look like over time. You can see this is 2015 through 2019. Can you all see back there? It's kind of a small slide. Okay and then the number of cases that are filed uh, per year and what our filing trends look like. So our 2019 numbers have been completed for our cases in Ramsey County. I think our, the next few slides are some breakdowns, more um, detailed breakdowns of this major slide, but this is um, um, the overall snapshot. Um, as you can see in most case areas, filings are down except in criminal, um, where filings are up. If you, if you look at the juvenile cases, um, that's a huge drop, 35% drop. And those are um, mostly because child protection cases are dropping uh, radically, which is good. We're trying to keep our families together. Um, and the increase in civil cases is mostly harassment restraining orders, which is sort of a quasi-criminal proceeding. Um, and the criminal cases are way, way up. The county attorney last year filed 25% more cases, more felonies than the year before. Um, and I just, we just had a meeting with them last week and they told uh, the chief and um, me and the head of our criminal division that they expect that that will continue. So those case filings are going to continue to be up. So this slide gives you a little, um, that's our, this is how we are compared to the state. So major criminals up 22% across the state, Ramsey's up 17%. Um, and then we're pretty much the same everywhere else, except major civil, our harassment restraining orders in Ramsey County are up much higher than the rest of the state. Yeah. Can you explain a little about why criminal cases up? I'm gonna get there, yeah. Okay, these are the breakdown. Here you go, this will help you out a little bit. So, 
Um, I'm going to deal with criminal last. So in civil, our major civil cases, personal injury is pretty flat. Contract is pretty flat. Other civil cases, which is sort of a hodgepodge of government related cases, that's been up a little bit. I think government litigation is up a little bit recently. Our harassment restraining orders is, are up 80%, which is just astronomical. Um, and so we are devoting more op, um, judicial resources to handling those calendars. Child protection, as you can see, truancy runaway down 65%. I think that is due in large part to initiatives that have been originated in the St. Paul Public Schools to try to get those kids to stay in school. Um, and the county attorney is sort of stepping back from enforcement of those issues. Child protection, which are uh, termination of parental rights, permanency, and child protection proceedings, those are way down. Same thing with juvenile delinquency. There are a lot of diversion and alternative initiatives that uh, the county attorney has initiated, uh, so those filings are way down. Criminal. Um, filings are up in felonies, major felonies, by 30%. Um, we have the same number of calendars, lawyers, judges, public defenders, handling 30% more cases. So our calendars are long, and it takes a long time to get through these cases, much longer than it has in the past. Um, and I don't like that. Um, I think especially for defendants who are in custody, they are entitled to a speedy trial. We want to get them uh, a resolution to their case as soon as possible. We also want to give their lawyers enough time to talk to them and to investigate their cases. And with the advent, and this is some of the reasons why these cases are taking longer, and I'll tell you why the filings are up, and then I'll tell you why the, first I'll tell you why they take longer, then I'll tell you why their filings are up. The filing, or the cases take longer to decide because you probably remember that pro about three years ago, four years ago, police pretty much metro-wide started wearing body-worn cameras. And when someone is, arrested and charged with a criminal offense, the prosecutor has to turn over every piece of evidence related to the offense. So if 10 police officers show up to the scene of an event, every one of them have a body-worn camera, and it's on the whole time. And so the defense lawyer has to watch all of that video for all of those officers and the dash cam for the police um, vehicle that they're, or the squad car that they're driving. And then they have to get the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension to conduct DNA testing or ballistics or fingerprint testing or um, blood work. And that takes time. They are backlogged, I think right now, seven months. Um, and so the time for us to, we try to get our cases done from door to door in a one year period of time for major felonies. And it's just not possible, um, especially with major, major cases like murders and sex offenses where there's so much evidence, um, so much investigation, and the lawyers just don't have the ability to get their, their job done. My number one job in a criminal case is to protect the rights of the defendant. Um, everybody has a constitutional right to a fair trial. They have the right to present a full and fair defense, and um, that is that's, I have to work every day to make sure that that guarantee is fulfilled. Every, I think anybody in this room, hopefully, if anybody were charged with a crime, you would want the same thing to happen to you or any other member of your family, that you were insured all of your constitutional rights were being protected um, so that we can have a fair trial. Case filings are up because there is a backlog of cases that the county attorney has been unable to prosecute um, because they've been short-staffed. So a whole crop of cases were filed recently with offense dates of more than a year old. And those are mostly property crimes, drug offenses, uh, lower level felonies. I mean, murders and sex offenses are usually tr um, charged out right away. We get those cases right away. Those individuals are in custody, and we prioritize those cases over other cases. But property crimes, such as theft of a motor vehicle or even a second-degree burglary or um, uh, um, identity theft cases, which are very serious offenses, drug offenses in some cases, those are all very serious offenses. 
but they just do not have the resources to be able to fully prosecute them in a timely manner. And so there's, and I've been over at the county attorney's office, I've seen it, there's stacks of files on the floor and the charging attorneys are just trying to get through as many as they can. And then when they get to the, the trial lawyer, the prosecutor, they also have murders and sex offenses on their docket and so they prioritize those cases first and then they get to the other cases when they can get to the other cases. And so like any public, um, like any public entity, they have to prioritize their work. There's just not an, an, um, an infinite well of resources, which is unfortunate. I wish we did have an infinite well of resources and then I think we'd be able to move through these cases a lot quicker and handle them and provide justice to people a lot faster. Um, but we're just not able to do it. So we're trying as hard as we can to figure out ways to um, put some less stress on the system. I will tell you that the county attorney um, has initiated some diversion efforts. So lower level offenses like first time theft offenses or some first time drug offenses, uh, those cases are being diverted out of the criminal system and so there are community consequences um, you, there, sometimes they go to a restorative practices circle, sometimes there's community work service involved or, uh, involved or fines, uh, but usually they're not ending up through our system. And so they're trying to ramp up those alternative initiatives to, to ease some of the burden as well. I will also say that, um, I mean, those are sort of the immediate reasons why these filings are up, but I would also say filings are up because of larger social issues that I think you're all familiar with, and that is we have an addiction crisis and we have a mental health crisis. And my, my guess based on my experience handling felony misdemeanor cases is that more than half of those cases have some drug addiction or mental health issue involved. Um, most theft cases are driven by addiction issues. I would say most person offenses, most violent offenses, um, assault related cases, there's some mental health issues involved and usually some drug issues involved as well. And um, we, you know, as judges, we're sort of at the bottom of a funnel of a, an investigation, a charging decision, a prosecution decision, and then it comes to us. And really the work with folks who are in crisis should be happening well up here at the top of the funnel so they don't end up at the bottom of the funnel. And then when they get through the funnel, if they happen to be placed on probation, the services available to probation to address these issues so that we don't end up having this person come back at the top of the funnel are so limited uh, that it just, it just is a cycle that unfortunately repeats itself quite often. I mean, from my perspective, I try to make the most of my interactions with people who may be in crisis and try to get them to um, at least acknowledge that there might be something greater than criminal behavior going on. Um, I think sometimes I'm successful in that regard. The other thing that I try to do sometimes is stagger a sentencing consequence. So for example, if I place somebody on probation and they violate a probation because they tested positive for drug or alcohol use, or they're not checking in with their probation officer because they are using in the community and they don't want their probation officer to know. Oftentimes when they come in in custody for a probation violation, usually on a, a warrant for their arrest, I'll release them and release them to a treatment facility and have them come back and see me in 30 or 60 or 90 days with the potential consequence hanging over their head if they aren't able to initiate some work to address their addiction issues in that interim period. And it's not always that easy, but sometimes you see a little sliver of success with folks who the light bulb just goes off or they're just motivated somehow. Um, and I, you know, I think it's different for everybody. Um, but that is a rewarding piece of my job when you finally get somebody to realize that there are people who are able to help you and who are extending a hand and if you take it, things can change in your life and when that happens, it's very rewarding. 
I don't get that opportunity all the time. And those opportunities don't really present themselves in violent person-related offenses. Um, but in other cases where drugs and mental health issues are driving lower level offenses, that does, um, that, that does um, spark a little um, compassion realization for me. So that's that issue. Um, one other thing I want to mention, uh, you may read stories in the newspaper about criminal dispositions or sentencings um, that happen and you might say, wow, that seems odd that this person isn't serving any more jail time and they're out in the community and it seems like what they did was really bad. And that does happen. And I read those stories too and sometimes I'm wondering what the heck happened here. That doesn't seem right to me either. So this is something that is not widely reported, but it is reality. And if you come to a sentencing calendar in court, you'll see this happening about 99% of criminal dispositions are by plea agreement. And those are agreements between the county attorney's office and the defense. And judges have nothing to do with those agreements. In fact, we are prohibited by law from interfering with those agreements. We can choose not to accept them at all, but we're really not in a good position to do that because we don't know what the evidence is. So remember, in a criminal proceeding, the state is charged with the burden of proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is a very, very high standard. And oftentimes the state makes a calculation that, um, okay, so I can prove my, I can prove my case. I don't know if I'm going to win, but maybe I can get this person on probation and get them some programming and some supervision in the community. If they plead to a lesser offense or I agree what the sentencing will be. And that's a calculation that they're entitled to make. That's the county attorney is the executive branch of government. And so as the coordinate judicial branch, we don't interfere with those decisions. We can reject them outright and not go along with it, but then the case has to get tried. And then we run the risk of an outright acquittal because the state can't prove its case. And then the person's not being supervised or having access to the services that they would get on probation. There was a, um, there was a case that was reported a couple of weeks ago about somebody who, um, well, I won't talk about it. <laughs> I don't think I should talk about it. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yes? Do you have any sense of what the percentage of cases that are plea bargained? Yes, about 99%. About 99% of the cases are resolved by agreement. Very few cases are tried. I think last year totaled in Ramsey County we had 87 trials. And as you can see, we have 1.3 million cases statewide. We probably have 10,000 cases a year that are criminal cases a year that are um, filed in Ramsey County. 87 cases were tried. Some of those cases are tried in two days. Some of those cases are tried in three weeks. So you can imagine how that breaks down. More complicated murder cases with DNA and experts and things like that take longer. Um, okay. Let's see, this is just more of the same. Oh, this is good, you'll like this. Um, we have some, in, we have some um, alternative initiatives to try to address some of the issues that I was talking about, particularly drugs and mental health issues. So about 10 years ago, Ramsey County judges, this is before my time, but Ramsey County judges um, we saw this consistent theme of addiction and mental health issues coming to us. Um, and we needed to do something about it because we really don't want people continuing to cycle through the criminal justice system. We want them to get well and be positive and productive members of the community. And so I think that the thought was that the services that certain folks in crisis were getting in probation was not enough. And we needed to have more intensive supervision, check-ins, um, and targeted uh, specialty programs for individuals with, with, a, with some motivation on the back end, which is there's a lesser criminal consequence if you are willing and able to undertake these intensive, lengthy, highly supervised um, initiatives to reintegrate yourself into your communities. 
And so over time, we have established four uh, treatment courts for our criminal um, uh, customers. So we have a drug court. It's called Adult Substance Abuse Court, DWI Court, Mental Health Court, and Veterans Court. And these initiatives, um, these courts have been uh, established in Ramsey County for quite some time, and they have now popped up all over the state. Um, and they are highly successful for in reducing recidivism and in helping our communities. Um, it's actually quite unbelievable. Most of these programs, most of these individuals who are enrolled in these treatment courts, it's a voluntary program. Um, the county attorney has to agree to allow individuals to be enrolled. Um, and these individuals are closely monitored and show up to court every week or every other week after a period of time to check in with the supervising judge. So when you saw that list of our judge breakdown, we have one judge who's dedicated to treatment courts, and that judge meets with these individuals week after week after week. There's consistency between them. They know their stories. They know their challenges. They know um, how to get people back on track if they're not on track, and they know um, when to celebrate their milestones. And um, the goal of all of these programs is to achieve sobriety, to achieve stability in mental health, to have stable housing, and to uh, establish employment. And um, when folks successfully graduate from these programs, they spend less time in jail, they gain in life skills, they um, are um, getting the treatment that they need, and we don't see them again. I have, I don't think I have ever seen someone who has successfully graduated from a treatment court program back in criminal court. And that is saying something. It is really um, fantastic. It's a hard, these are hard programs. They are intensive. And as you might imagine, addiction and mental health is no joke. Those are very serious um, issues. And um, when you see someone overcome those issues, it's really unbelievable and rewarding. Um, we have parties and cake to celebrate and applause when f folks graduate, and it's, um, it's really great. And we do this in partnership with probation and other community organizations and the VA. It's really great. Yeah. I've been to one of those graduations, and I would say the people, everybody in those rooms is smiling as much as they would be smiling in the It is super great. It is, it is wonderful. It is wonderful. Yeah. I'd encourage you to go. Veterans Court is every Wednesday morning in Ramsey County. That's my favorite. I think it's just a wonderful service that we're able to provide for the people who served us. Yes. So who gets, who decides who gets to be part of that? And is it kind of like a plea deal? It can, it can be. Um, usually, well, I'll start there. So the criminal disposition is usually moved out to see how somebody's going to do in their program. So we don't end up doing a sentencing or we don't end up um, establishing what the consequence for the criminal behavior is until we see, you know, acceptance of responsibility, demonstration of remorse, um, evidence that the recidivism rate is going to be down, that somebody's no longer a danger to themselves or others in the public. Um, it is voluntary program. Usually the defense lawyer will inquire um, for a referral to drug court or treatment court, or I do it on my own initiative oftentimes. So last week I handled the felony arraignment calendar and an individual came in and he was there for a low-level drug offense. It was his third drug offense. Um, there was no other, there were no person crimes on his bail evaluation, and they were just going to move the case to the next hearing, and I asked the lawyer, I said, have you had a discussion with your client about whether he's interested in drug court? And then they had a little discussion off the record, and then they came back and said, yeah, he'd like a referral to drug court. So we'll keep the criminal proceeding moving until someone is accepted into the program, but give them an opportunity to see if this is a program that might be good for them and if they qualify for the program. Yeah. I know that dual diagnosis is common. Where do you put those pieces in involve both mental health and some kind of criminal? Uh, well, uh, or, I'm sorry, mental health and... Um... There's, cro there's crossover in all of them. I mean, veterans court, yep. 
Um, so usually what happens is they get a referral to treatment court, and because there's one treatment court judge, and there's a team of professionals that work in treatment court that are employed in the county, um, usually it's a, it's a whole person examination, and we just figure out which treatment court is best suited to this particular individual. And, um, you know, DWI and adult substance abuse court, those sort of go hand in hand. Mental health court and addiction issues do go hand in hand. It just, sometimes it depends on which court is full, um, which programs are more um, well suited to the individual. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're coming up on time here, so I wanna get through some of these other issues. I want to talk about one other issue that we are trying to, um, or that we have uh, initiated in the entire judicial branch, and that is helping our self-represented litigants. We spend a lot of time talking about criminal proceedings. I want to talk about our other proceedings and how we're trying to provide access to justice for folks who can't afford a lawyer in the civil context or the family context so that they can um, use the justice system to, the, to their benefit as well. So we have established a number of programs to help people represent themselves in court. We have a new program called Starting a Divorce in Minnesota. That's for all uh, divorce types. It's all of the paperwork, instructions, um, processes to get a divorce uh, completed in Minnesota. That is with or without children joint petitions with or without children. So we're trying to help folks um, avoid the um, sometimes now high, very high costs of um, hiring attorneys um, if they can get these, these um, sort of uncomplicated matters completed on their own. Um, we, had more, we have had more than 1,200 individuals already use this program successfully, and we have also rolled out guides for conciliation court and housing court, and we've had 4,000 people use those guides uh, successfully. So that's really great. We also have um, a statewide self-help center that is available by phone, by email, by Skype, by um, like a chat, uh, a little computer chat. Um, and um, we have kiosks in a number of our courthouses so that the people can get their questions answered in a self-guided way. Um, some of those kiosks, or most of, I think maybe all of those kiosks have multiple languages so that we have, um, we're able to serve some of our non-English speaking customers as well. In Ramsey County, we're very um, fortunate to have our own interpreter's office with our own staff interpreters for Hmong and Spanish speaking customers. Uh, and then we have access, of course, to interpreters uh, of all different languages. And they are instrumental in helping all of our customers understand court proceedings of all different kinds. So I want to take some more of your questions. Um, I just want to summarize a couple of takeaways for you. Number one, I hope I demystified the system a little bit. I know it can be scary and confusing, and what do you guys do up there in your courthouse? And so hopefully I gave you a little bit of um, information about that. Um, second, I want you to take away how accountable we are to the public. Um, we keep very detailed statistics on everything that we do. We have a very open and transparent system all of our courtrooms are open. I have never closed a courtroom. I highly doubt that I ever will, um, uh, maybe with the exception of some juvenile proceedings which are, which are required by statute. Um, I, I believe that people should know what we do. I believe that people should ask questions about what we do, and um, I think that that promotes public trust and confidence in your elected officials. We represent you, we're here to serve you, and, um, and, and in my view, this is one of the greatest public services that a lawyer can um, provide to the community. Um, what else do I want you to take away? I have to give credit for where credit is due. Judges don't do this work alone. We have court reporters who take the record of proceedings. We have law clerks who are the right hand of judges. We have court administration that makes sure that these calendars are scheduled and run on time and that courtrooms are available. We have staff at all levels and the only way that this system works is for everybody to do the best they can 
um, to make this system as accountable as possible and provide justice for all. And um, the last thing that I want you to take away, and that this is particularly apt for this audience, is that this is a people business. I deal with people all day, every day, in every context. People I don't know. I'm going to meet once in my life. Um, usually people who are in crisis, in very stressful situations. And we do our best, or I try to do my best, of making the most out of every interaction that I have with um, any, anybody who appears in court to treat them with respect, with dignity, to make sure they understand what's going on, to answer their questions, and to ensure that they have their rights uh, protected and that they receive justice for whatever it is that they're, um, they're, they're in court for.